also color. So the concept of how to add color to television wasn't a terrible leap. It was just a matter of embedding a little more into the signal. The problem was the FCC said that the signal had to be backwards compatible with, with black and white television sets, meaning if you already owned a black and white television set, the FCC said you should not lose access to your regular programming. So when the engineers figured out how to do color, they had to accommodate a way to pull it back so that the people with the black and white sets could still see their pictures, could still see a black and white version of the picture. And they wrestled with how to do this, and they came up with a compromise. They said, if we slow the frame rate down from 30 frames per second to 29.97 frames per second, that would give us a 0.03 hundredth of a, of a second in order to put the color subcarrier onto the signal. And that was a good compromise. Now the people with black and white could still see the regular picture like they saw normally, and they had just a little, they slowed down the, the image just a little bit uh, just to get a little more information in that, that signal. Now, the problem with early color was uh, there was, it was prone to drift, um, particularly in really saturated reds and really saturated blues. This, because of the, the way the color was done, the, the more edits they made, the further the color would drift. They also ran into the problem that the clock would get off, and meaning that a 30... Uh, a 30 frame per second program running at 29.97 is not going to fit quite in the same way. The end result is if you run it, run an hour long program at 30 frames per second on a 29.97 program on a 29.97 broadcast, you end up with a program that's an hour and four seconds long. So that's when they invented drop frame, and the idea of drop frame is it drops one frame one frame every second on the second except the 10th second. Uh, and mathematically it works out so that it keeps the clock in sync with the hour. The only time you have to worry about drop frame versus non-drop is uh, if you're editing a program for television. And honestly, it only matters if you're doing like an hour long program. If you're just doing a commercial, they're not gonna notice. If you do something that's gonna be longer, then you gotta work in drop frame because otherwise you're throwing the broadcast channel's clock off. NDF versus DF. I just explained that. Uh, yeah, there I wrote it. Uh, in TV time, a one-hour NDF program equals an hour and four seconds in real time. So for television purpose, if you want to stay on the television clock, you have to edit hour-long programs in, uh, in uh, drop frame. Ghosting. Um, now, ghosting was what I was just mentioning, uh, the color was prone to drift. And it would just, the because the, the way the signal was put together, it was one signal, but the color was on a subcarrier, on a separate signal. And with each edit, with each video edit you put together, that color would drift further and further apart from the subject. So you really wanted something that you wouldn't have to make more than, you know, three or four dubs of before the color start to get noticeably off. There's another example of ghosting. Ghosting and interlaced. The way they kind of solved this problem of color drift was they tried to work with very muted palettes. If you look at color television shows from the 60s and early 70s, they tend to have a very soft, muted palette and very pastel. And the reason is, if the color was softer, you wouldn't notice drift as much. If the color was vibrant, it was more obvious that it was getting out of sync. So a lot of the television shows from the 60s and early 70s have very soft color palettes. Now here's a picture of Gilligan's Island. Gilligan's Island was originally shot in black and white and then changed over to color. But you'll notice, if you look at this picture, they have some very vibrant colors going on in this picture. And you may be saying to yourself, well, Ken, you just said they couldn't do that. Well, they did. The reason Gilligan's Island got away with it was Gilligan's Island was shot and edited on film. So they were able to control their color all the way up until it went on the air. And then when it went on the air, it was either broadcast from the film 
copy or they would make one transfer to video and send that out to TV stations. So they were able to control their color in the film process. Um, the problem with color drift came in when they tried to film things on video. Now in the mid 1980s, uh, Sony invented something new called Betacam. The thing about Betacam was it allowed the, the videotape to have two separate inputs, one for the black and white base signal, the, the signal that the, the video image is based on, and one for the color subcarrier. So it separated these out. And even in Betacam, they even did red, green, and blue. So each color had its own separate space on the videotape. And when they did this, it suddenly became possible to start filming with vibrant colors. You can mark the arrival of Betacam with the arrival of Elmo. Jim Henson was sitting around waiting for his chance to use a red puppet, and as soon as Elmo came along, bam, there it was. Another famous story about the color was when they first came out with Sesame Street, uh, Oscar the Grouch was actually an orange puppet, and when they put him on camera, they realized they had a bad problem with color drift. And they said, we got to find a color that's not going to drift this bad. So they changed him to a green puppet. He's kind of a brownish green puppet now. And that's the reason he's brownish green is because that color was more controllable. They wouldn't, didn't have to worry about color drift with the early composite video. When Betacam arrived, that was no longer an issue. They said, we can do vibrant colors now. Here's Elmo. Um... Elmo. Also with the arrival of Betacam, it now became possible to do green screen and blue screen effects on video. Um, it was possible earlier to do those effects. However, because the signal was in one pipe, it was difficult to get a, a crisp edge around it. So Betacam pushed forward the blue screen and green screen technology that we use so prevalently today. FCC. I'm going to stop there.